My name is Mickey Barker and today is July the 16th, 2002. I'm in Chattanooga, Tennessee to interview Selma Cash Patey. This interview is taking place as part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. You are Selma Cash Patey, but I've always called you Sonny. Will that be okay if I That'd call you Sonny fine. today? I'd prefer it, Judge. And looking at your uh, By the way, if you weren't a Supreme Court judge, I'd call you Mickey. Well, call me that anyway. No. Uh, <laughs> I still have cases I'm working on. I think I've we're been called a lot worse. <laughs> well, let me ask you a few questions about your, your family background. Uh, my understanding from looking at your CV is that you were born in New York City back in March of 1927. That's correct. How did you wind up in Chattanooga, Tennessee? All right. My father had a cut-making trim company called Greenberg Clothing Company in New York City. And in 19, about 32, probably 33, they were in a depression state, you might remember. No, I'm not quite that old, but... <laughs> and Sears Roebuck, do you even know what a cut, make, and trim baker yes. is? Okay. But our, our listeners might not, why don't you explain it? Okay. Sears did, never made anything. Sears has factories. They're called cut, make, and trim factories. They still work pretty much the same way. They bought the material, they warehoused it to his place, <clears throat> they drew it out, and... <clears throat> Build it to him. He cut it, laid it in layers. He cut it, and then his sewing machines, 125 operators, would make it into a pair of pants or a jacket, put a Sears label on it. It was called a cut, make, and trim. Mm. And they went out and they told their factory owners, You can't work in a Union City. The unions are killing us in the price. You're going to have to go south. So they gave us, gave him, I was six years old, <laughs> they gave him the choice of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And when we drove up to Chattanooga, and there was a big sign on Macaulay Avenue Tunnel that said, Welcome. And my mother looked at Chattanooga and she started crying. And <clears throat> my father said, Marion, it's all right. Don't cry. We have one more prospect. There's a factory in Sweetwater, Tennessee, <laughs> that Sears has made arrangements for us to see. Well, when she saw Sweetwater, Chattanooga looked wonderful to her. <laughs> so Chattanooga became our home. Now, were you the oldest of your siblings or the middle? I'm the baby. The baby. How many brothers and sisters <clears throat> did you no have? No brothers. Had two sisters. One was 12 years older than I, Helen Lang, and the other one was Bernice Eulin who was married to Dr. Lewis Eulin, and she was six years older than I. She would tell you if she was still alive that she was five and a half years older than I. <laughs> so you were then uh, educated in Chattanooga in the public Always. schools, Missionary Ridge Elementary School, which is now closed up. Right. Uh, do you remember the names of any of your teachers at Missionary Ridge? Oh, come on, Mickey. <laughs> Pardon me, Judge. Dude. That's been a lot of years ago. It's going to be awfully hard for me to stick with yeah. Judge as long but as... But did you live on the other. Ridge? Huh? You lived on the Ridge? Yes. And then after that, you went to City you remember, High School? Uh, I remember, I think you do, <clears throat> the McDonald's who were with the Free Press. Oh, yes. They live within a block of us, and we carpooled with them. I've always been very proud of them because they were good friends, and carpooled with us to Missionary Ridge School, which was the only way people got to school then. There were no buses. You, your parents took you, or your mother usually took you. How long did it take your mother to get accustomed to Chattanooga, or did she ever get accustomed to it? That's a good question. Not really. <clears throat> when I was about 12, she had nagged, I guess would be an appropriate word, my father so much about going back to New York. He said, I never get to go to the opera. I don't get to go to the ballet anymore. When are we going to go back to civilization? So Dad told her if it meant that much to her, she never sold our home there. We lived in the Bronx, and she still had her house on Claflin Avenue. I do remember that. <clears throat> and. That was her escape hatch. So he said, go back and live for a year. Take Selma with you. 
I was still Thelma then. And if it means that much, at the end of the year, I'll sell the factory and we'll move back to New York. So she and I did. And of course, what happened was in that year, we never, she never went to the opera. She never went to the ballet. We used to go to New York and do all those things every summer and every winter. We'd go to the Metropolitan Opera. And when she lived there, nobody goes downtown. Went once a week, I went to the piano lesson in Greenwich Village, and that was the sole extent of going downtown. Mm -hmm. Were your parents from New York City originally? Yes. Okay. Well, now originally, how far back, I don't know who my father's parents are. My mother's parents lived in the Bronx. Yeah. And that's what we considered home. Now, my mother was born in the United States. My father was not. Where was he born? I had Russia. Oh, I know it was Russia. Because he always told us that. My father's done a lot of things if you had listened to him. He was in the Russian army. He taught Hebrew. He tutored Hebrew. Uh, he, he did a lot of things to have come over here when he was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. But I give him a great deal of credit. One thing I do know is he came over here not knowing any English. He worked a laundry cart pushing, which they used to in New York, along the streets. They would collect your laundry and then return it to you. And he went to school at night, and from that, he got a job as a cutter, and then he became a factory owner. And mm. he, he worked very hard to get where he was, considering he started with absolutely nothing. And how long did he live? Uh... He was 92. <laughs> 92? Yeah. I got at least another 10 years yeah, coming well you, to me. <laughs> <laughs> you come from good He good still, genes. up until probably four, three or four years before he died, would fuss at me about the fact that I encouraged him to sell his factory when he was only 75 years old and could have worked another 10 years. Why did you do that? I had a real good buy, uh, <laughs> purchaser, and they would give him a five-year contract as a consultant and his friends at Sears were dying, and I was afraid they wouldn't give him any business right. anymore. What was the Jewish community like in Chattanooga when you moved here? And small. <laughs> That's yeah. the first word I use, small. Yeah. Cohesive. Uh, segregated, some of it by their own choice. They lived in uh, just a few areas in Chattanooga. Some of it was not of their choice. Some of it was because they were not permitted to buy in areas. Mm. You didn't buy property and look at Mountain Signal Mountain. Uh, Shepherd Hills didn't permit Jews. I got a lot of satisfaction about that. I used to, I bought a house once and built a house on Shelford Road, which overlooked Shepherd Hills, I so I could that. spit down on it. I remember that. <laughs> Have times changed any in that respect, or do you just still feel any, any uh, discrimination? No, but I want to be fair. I don't know how much was because the Jewish community didn't really want to mix that. I wasn't permitted to date Gentile boys. I did. I love you all, but my, I didn't dare tell my mother. That was my late dates. <laughs> my first dates were with good Jewish boys who would come up the front door. My late dates were with you, Goyim, who had to sneak in the back door. Do you know the term Goyim? Tell me. I'm not sure. It's not a bad word. <laughs> Gentile. <laughs> None of you. Now, did your parents speak Yiddish? I guess they did if they came from New York. Oh, yes. And can you still speak any Yiddish? No. Yeah. They spoke Yiddish only when they didn't want me to know or my sisters to know what they were saying. I wish they had been more outgoing and talk to us because I would like to know a second language. I would like to be able to communicate. My father used to read the... <coughs> Yiddish uh, newspaper, and I've forgotten even what the name of it is. Yeah. But for years he did. Well, let's go forward to, you graduated from high school in what year? Chattanooga High School, 1945. And that was just as the war was ending. Yes. Do you remember World War II pretty vividly? I guess you know, You know, I must have graduated in 44. I'm trying to think, because uh, I went to the University of Wisconsin that the summer of the year I graduated. And I went there for one year. And I married Mickey Cash the, that summer. And the war ended within six months after I joined him in Norfolk, Virginia. 
So I must have a year wrong. And what was in Norfolk, Virginia? He was in the Marine Corps. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> so I wanted to go with him. Don't ask me why I wanted to get married. I couldn't give you one good reason except they looked so cute in that uniform. And everybody was getting married. And how old were you when, you when you married him? 18. And then after the war, you went on to Wisconsin, is that what you said, or you came back? Before, to uh, well, as soon as I graduated from high school, I went to the University of Wisconsin during the summer term. Then I went the next year to the university okay. up there. Then I married him. That was an experience, very educational. And uh, somewhere along the line, you decided you wanted to go to law school. How did that come about? I never decided to go to law school. Let's understand that. Mickey's brother was Ben Cash, who was a very well-known lawyer in Chattanooga. Ben wanted Mickey to become a lawyer. So they picked out Cumberland Law School as soon as the war was over, if you remember, I do think you remember, yeah. they had the GI Bill of Rights. Right. And of course, Mickey was eligible, having been in the Marine Corps for three years. So Ben decided that we, pardon me, he didn't care if I went, he wanted his brother to go to Cumberland Law School. And I had been studying journalism because I loved to write and I thought that was a good thing for a woman to do. I could write magazine articles and send them in. I could write novels. I could be this wonderful author and still stay home and raise ch children and do what a good yeah. Jewish mother would do, and wife. So they told me that was okay, that there was another school there called Cumberland University, and that I could complete my education when I got there. When I got there, I found out that the only graduate school they had there was their ministerial school. I could become a Presbyterian minister, <laughs> or I could become a lawyer. Those were my two choices. At Cumberland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Being Jewish, it was a little more limited than that. How many other women were in the law school besides you when you entered? Probably about five, uh, as I recall. Two of them were simply going, in my opinion, were going because their husbands had been in service, and they had been in service, I'm sorry. And they could go, and it was draw yeah. extra money that way. They could both get money for going. And the others, I think, were very serious about it. Well, when you first began your law career, law school career, did you like it from the beginning, or was it something that, that you just endured? I loved law, but I never contemplated being a lawyer. Why? I wasn't foolish. I knew that the, that was a male bastion. Women didn't do that, and they didn't. Uh, they weren't the lawyers, they were the secretaries, they were the researchers, they worked for the county, they worked for the state, and that wasn't what I wanted to do. Now we're talking, just to make sure we understand, our listeners understand, we're talking about the years from say 47 to about 50 when you were in law school, or 47 to 49? <clears throat> uh, I've been a lawyer since 1947. Okay. So I went to school from 45 to 47. I thought we missed a year there. Yeah. Because I finished my undergraduate work at Cumberland while I was doing my law school. I didn't like very much because I had taken very concentrated courses during that summer school. And, when and you, you only needed two years then. You didn't need four. You needed yeah. two years of pre-law before you could go to Cumberland. But they let me do it all at the same time. And did you and Mickey graduate from law school at the same time? Yes, we did. And then came back to Chattanooga, or did you go somewhere else? We went in to practice with his brother. Ben? Ben Cash. It became Cash, Cash, and Cash. I like the name of that. That's why I've always kept that name. When you moved back here in 47, how many other women were there who were admitted to the bar and practicing <coughs> here? Do you remember? I can't tell you that. If you ask me how many were practicing in court, none. None. Uh, if you ask me how many had law degrees, there were several. There, some of them had passed the bar. 
But again, they were buried in the office. They would go to work thinking, I'm sure they were going to be lawyers. Maybe they did some office law. I can't tell you about that. Yeah. But there was nobody that went to court. That was what was not acceptable. You and remember the, the first I, time you went to court? Huh? You remember the first time you went to court? Sessions Court, sure I do. What year would that have been in? Uh, probably 48, 49. And do you remember the case? Oh, no. <laughs> it would have been a collection case because when I got out, you have to understand something. I never intended to be a lawyer. I still intended to be a good Jewish wife and mother. That was my plan. But Mickey told me very early in the marriage that he didn't expect to work very hard. And that he liked to hunt and fish. And that if he'd learned anything in Guadalcanal, it was that you better seize the day, more or less. You probably know the Latin expression mm -hmm. for that. I don't. I didn't take Latin. No. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> I took it, but that's been 40 years ago, 50 years ago. <laughs> but anyway, that was his whole creed. So I thought, okay, if we're going to do that. By this time, I had a daughter because my first child was born in law school. That'd be Pamela. That's Pamela Dwyer. Right. Who's, who's also a lawyer here in your office now. Right. right. And your second child was born when? I'm sorry. Your second child. <coughs> Charles is my adopted child. Right. And he was adopted here. I've had him since he's three years old. I've had him. He's had me, however you want to put it. We've had each other. And Charles is also a lawyer here in your office Correct. now. And then I had a, a, I have five. The middle child is Kim Ellen Clark, who now calls herself as an artist, Kim Alexander, taking my father's first name. And she is an artist here in Chattanooga, who's doing very well with concrete structures that she decorates and sells. Very beautiful. Let me ask you this, when, when, when you were raising these children, did you ever take time off from work as you would get pregnant? Today we have maternity leave and... How you and, know better than that? Well, tell us about how that worked in your case. For example... I when, never missed a day of school. I never missed a day of work. If you plan it exactly right, you can give birth starting on Fridays and you can be back on Monday. The only thing that made me mad in law school, I missed the first bar exam I was going to take. You could take the bar six months before you graduated. So I had planned to take it in January so that I could start practicing, come back in June or July when I graduated from law school. But unfortunately, Pam decided to be born on January 13th. I didn't make that bar exam. Mm. But that's the only time that pregnancy ever interrupted anything that I was planning to do. Mm. I would have them break my water on Friday, and then I could be back to work on Monday. I did miss one Monday docket. I was very upset about that. I had a ligation with my last child, and <clears throat> my brother-in-law, Louis Ulam, was my doctor, and he knew how I was about not missing work because, see, I didn't think women ought to miss work. You men could miss. But if I missed work, then it's because I was a woman. So I made it a policy that I never asked to be off anything. And he had gone to Las Vegas and wasn't there, so the new doctor didn't understand how things worked, and he didn't understand the importance of, missing, of being at a Monday doctor. And by the time I finished arguing with him about whether or not I could leave the hospital, the docket was over and it didn't make any difference. <laughs> so, but that's never interfered. <clears throat> did, did you ever at the beginning of your career experience any different kind of treatment, you think, from other lawyers or judges oh, sure. because you were a woman? And tell, me, <laughs> tell us about that. You want me to be nice or you want me to be honest? I want you to be honest. Okay. Because I usually tell people, oh, no, the lawyers were wonderful. They all welcomed me. That's not true. And realistically, you would know that's not true. We're talking about a time when women weren't even serving on the juries. So how could it be true? And the men liked their all-male society. And so obviously, here comes this very brash young woman who thinks she's going to come in here and practice law. 
the judges would insist that I be on time when the men could horse around and be late if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't say they insisted I be on time. That's not very fair. They would just be cutting about it. Well, where were you? And they knew I was always on time. I was always prepared for my cases, but if something happened and a witness wasn't available, then I got a hard time. Mm -hmm. But for a long time, see, I didn't realize why I was being treated that way. I had suffered discrimination. I hate that word, suffered. I had been aware that there was discrimination from the time I was six years old and I came to Chattanooga, Tennessee as a Yankee, Jew, living out in Brainerd, where there were not many Jewish people, first of all. They didn't like Yankees coming in. Now, that was a given. Chattanooga was not as cosmopolitan, <coughs> pardon me, as it is now. <coughs> so I was perfectly aware there were some hurdles that I was going to have to overcome back then. That type of discrimination existed throughout high school. There were certain sororities that I was not allowed to join. So when I started practicing law, I just thought that was an extension of what I had already had back there. Didn't understand part of it, because I talked pretty Southern by then. I'm covering the mic, and the recorder's going to be very angry with me, and I'm sorry. Um, and it just didn't occur to me that it was because I was a woman. I mean, that I loved being a woman. That was the one thing I was, thought was to my advantage. And here I was thinking, these guys are not treating Mickey differently, and he's Jewish. Must be something else. When I'd walk in a jury room, the lawyers, where the lawyers would gather, you know that. Mm -hmm. If there wasn't a jury, the lawyers would get back there, talk, smoke, then tell jokes. I could walk in that jury room and be absolute cold silence. So yeah, I was aware there was a difference. I was never asked to serve on a committee from the Chattanooga Bar Association until probably been practicing 15 years. And John Stoffel came in one day and said, Sonny, how come you never do anything with the Bar Association? said, nobody ever asked me. He said, well, I think it's time you ran for the board. And so I said, okay, sounds like a good idea. Will you support me? And he said, yeah. What year was that? Do you remember? Oh, I hate when you do that to me. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to put it in something. Was it about early 60s, maybe? Uh, probably late 50s, okay. I think. Late 50s, I think. Uh, no. I'd already been practicing for 10 or 15 years, Mickey. We're going to have to step up there. You want to look at look, look at our boredom, because I don't really remember what the dates were. Well, we don't need to get bogged down too much on the dates, but it was about 15 years or so yeah. before you began to notice any change. And he was very kind and supportive, and uh, I did get on the board. And that worked out really well. Then I decided it worked so well, I ran for secretary and got elected to that. Always had competition, always had somebody against me. But I didn't mind that. And then I said, okay, now, gentlemen, I don't want to be the secretary anymore. I want to be the president. All right. And they said, no. <laughs> no, we wouldn't support you for that. You know, At that point, we were going up, you know, if you became to this chair, then you go to that chair, and then you go on, and pretty soon you're president-elect, and then you get to be president. So I said, okay. So I went over and worked with the Chattanooga trial lawyers, which was a much smaller group, and worked myself up in that one until I got to be president of that. Then I went back to the Chattanooga Bar, and Charlie Gerhauser was supposed to come on up about that time. And I went to Charlie, and I said, you know, Charlie, you're younger than I am. And I want to come back in now, and I want to run for president-elect at the Chattanooga Bar Association. And I think I've earned it now. 
Maybe I hadn't before, but I believe I have now. I've made my share of speeches. I've done the committee work. Now I'm ready. And he said, well, you know, it's my turn to run. I said, well, maybe it is, but I wanted you to give the way to me. And he very kindly did. I think I've looked at my notes. I believe that was in 1974. Right. I was getting a little older. I right. felt like it was my turn. I told you I had about 15 years, probably about 20 years that I'd been a lawyer before I started. So you began your practice in 1947, and so that was 25 to 28 years before you became president of the Chattanooga Bar. Right. What type of practice? You said you began as a, as a collection lawyer. What type of practice did you have and how did it develop through the years? Okay. Let's remember that not only did the lawyers not think much of women lawyers, the public didn't think much of women lawyers either. And I could never have started a practice except for the fact there were a lot of Jewish merchants in Chattanooga and they had given Ben Cash some accounts to collect. And again, it's hard for people nowadays to even imagine what credit was in those days. We're talking about days when, before credit cards, days before people had checking accounts. Very few people had checking accounts, only the middle class and above. Yeah. So there were all these people who made bills that they could pay by the week or by the month, and they would go around and either pay at some, some store or a collector would go out and collect from them. So when you sued on an account, people would come to your office and they would pay you. Maybe a dollar a week, maybe two dollars a week. And on paydays, big days, that DuPont had paydays, Combustion had paydays, the U.S. Pipe had paydays. I would work out in the collection office and I would take their money, write the receipts, talk to the people, get to know them, and pretty soon they start bringing me their business, their other business. And that's how I built my practice, was that of those people. I remember when I first began practicing in Chattanooga in 1967, and at that time, as I recall, it was you, H.L. Smith, and Mark Mayfield had about all the collection business in this city. You had a that very successful... That's probably Charles Fisk Ralston, uh, even before Mark Mayfield. Yeah. You had one of the most successful collection practices in this city. That's right. And I loved it. I loved the people content. Uh, I loved going to Sessions Court. It's a more relaxed type of thing. Yeah. And of course, Mickey Cash made me a good lawyer, and I'm very grateful to him because he'd call up a couple of times and say, I'm not coming to court today. I'm going to go fishing or hunting today. So I'd grab up some files and go up there and try some cases. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> So, so he helped you become a good lawyer by Absolutely. default? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, well, I don't want to bring up anything sad, but you and Mickey eventually divorced. Yeah, though yeah. that wasn't sad. That was great. <laughs> I loved my ex-husbands. I always loved them once I was ex. It was only being married to them I didn't like. <laughs> well, was it difficult to begin practicing alone after you and Mickey divorced? I wasn't alone. I stayed in the office with his brother, Ben Cash. Okay. I liked the Cashes. It was Mickey I didn't like. Okay. So Ben and I stayed. However, we were not really a partnership except that Ben was a wonderful business getter. Oh. Ben was in the legislature, if you'll remember, for oh. many years. And he could just, he'd walk out on the street and lawsuits would follow him. Mickey had that same talent, by the way. So he would get the business, I would handle it, and we would divide the fee. That business that I got myself was my business. My collection business was mine. Because I made Mickey a very fair deal. And the deal was, you give me the three children, the house we live in, and the law practice, and you can have the house on the lake, the apartments we owned, and you can practice law anywhere, do anything that you want to do, except don't touch my collection work. And that was the deal. I didn't want any support. I didn't want anything except my kids and my practice. And that was in 1955? Gosh, I don't remember. Let's see, I married him in 40, probably 45, married to him eight years, 53, maybe. Yeah. Did it say 55 on there? <laughs> I don't recall. I don't remember. It either. doesn't matter much. I guess what is important is, is eventually Benny Cash became a Sessions judge. Right. And then you were solo. Yes. And how difficult was that? 
Oh, I love that. Because I'd really been alone all the time. Uh, Mickey was not very work-oriented. He liked people. He liked to go out and get business, uh, talk to people. Ben, as I say, he did his thing, I did mine. So really, the office was mine. Uh, we just had a, a nice agreement. I always enjoyed working with Ben Cash. I loved working alone. Mm -hmm. I worked alone until Pam got out of law school with her then husband, Phil Lawrence. Well, wow, that's interesting that you should say that you enjoyed working alone. Most lawyers today love to be in big law firms, and we've got some in Tennessee that are over 400 lawyers. What, what, what was special about being a solo practitioner? You had total control of your cases. I loved that. I liked the clients walking in. I knew who they were. We now have to put pictures of, we don't have to, we do. We take pictures of our clients and put it in an Abacus program so that if one of us happens to talk to somebody on the phone or one of the secretaries do, they don't know the client, they can call it up and see the picture in Abacus. When I was a sole practitioner, nobody in my office needed a picture. We knew who the clients were. Mm -hmm. We'd see them on the street, we knew them. You know, it wasn't any guess about who was who. I loved having total control of the money. I've always enjoyed that. You, you were your own bookkeeper, too? Yes. Oh, yeah. I used to keep all my books by hand, you all still, those collection accounts. You'd see Sonny sitting there with a bunch of cards, cutting out that fee, whether it's 25 percent, a third, or what the fee was, and posting them in a book, and then having it typed for the client. And some of these, some of these judgment debtors were paying two or three dollars a week, yes. and you were taking twenty-five or third of that every week. Huge every amount, week. Huge amount of bookkeeping. Huh? Huge amount of bookkeeping. I know. The first time I got a bookkeeping machine, I was so excited because it could be programmed to actually type the. You make out a card on the person, and then it would put the date and put the amount paid that you punch in. But it still wouldn't, the first machine I got wouldn't take the amount of percentage of fee. So I'd still have to go back and put in the fee because they were varying them out, either 25% or a third. Occasionally 50% if they were very small accounts. Now how would you, how would you react to, to some of the, the sad tales you would hear? And Friday afternoon came and somebody came in and said, Ms. Pady, I just don't have the money this week to pay on that debt. I've got to do something else. How would you handle that? That was really bad because back in those days, the garnishment law was different. The garnishment law was that you could hold all of their check after a certain percentage, and usually it was 25 percent they got to keep. But they'd get that in the first month, week, say, of a month. So mm -hmm. if you garnish sheet, and we always did in the third and fourth week, you could hold their whole check. And that would be very heartless. So usually they did come in and they did tell you they had to have some money and you'd issue a partial release so they could have something. A lot of the lawyers were upset when they changed the garnishment law to make it uh, exempt so much every week. I was delighted because it was a very sad thing. And of course, we didn't always turn it loose. If you'd look for somebody for a couple of years and they made you find them, I wouldn't turn it loose. Mm -hmm. But it was hard. Then when they got to where it was a percentage of every payday, it was easier. Yeah. Like most things, everybody fought the change. Oh, it's going to ruin us. We'll never be able to collect money. And it turned out to be a benefit. So you practiced law by yourself, and then eventually, after your divorce from Mickey, you married Ralph Payton. Yeah. And now, Ralph I had another one in there. Let's oh. not forget Jack Hurst. He was a nice guy. Well, Jack was, uh, he came between Mickey and all right, tell us a little about your relationship with Jack. Was he a lawyer too? No, he's a mechanic. I'd had enough of lawyers at that point. <laughs> I never made that mistake again. No, he was a mechanic and he was a very nice person. It was just that he was a much better lover than husband because we had a lot more. That was what we had in common, let me put it that way. He read funny books and I read law books. I liked the ballet and he liked the uh, Car racing. Yeah. Okay. It's just we just didn't hit it. The only thing he had that I loved were his two children. Okay. And that was what really the reason I married him. I just thought, well, we'll mail these family. I've got three, he's got two. He's a good man. 
He'll be a good father to my children. I'll be a wonderful mother to his, and we'll just do beautifully. Well, that would have been fine, except he and I didn't get along. The kids blended beautifully. <laughs> After I divorced him, his children stayed with me for another probably three to four years until he remarried and wanted his kids back. So you had five children you were raising for alone for a while? Uh-huh. And, and working every day? Yes. But you can do that. Uh, How did you find time to date and court uh, Ralph Patey with five children to look after? I play bridge. Okay. He was a bridge player. That was his attraction. He was a great bridge player, best card handler I've ever sat across from. But as I recall, you were a great bridge player and probably still are. Not as good as he. <laughs> Although I did win one with Kyle Weems that I was very proud of. Uh, won a big tournament with Kyle, another lawyer, about 10 years ago, and that was fun. But Mickey and I won a lot. We had a lot of, um, pardon me, wrong hope. <laughs> Ralph and I had a lot of fun. Had a lot of fun with Mickey, too. I enjoyed all of them. They were all nice guys. Well, you told us earlier that when you would have your children, you would try to schedule it so so your brother-in-law would induce labor on Friday and you would have the children over the weekend and come to work Monday, and you didn't like to miss work. Did you ever take off from work any to go to your children's soccer games or baseball games or sure, school that, activities? I mean to cut you off. It's one of the habits I have. Uh, that was the nice part of practicing by yourself is you could do those things. You could schedule your cases so that you could do the sessions court work particularly. Usually you were out of court back in those days by noon. Right. It's not like it is now where they have two courts a day, sometimes three. So if you had cases in the morning, be free in the afternoon. <clears throat> and I, I got to go to all those things. That was not a problem. Eventually, uh, after you and Ralph married, he came to work in the office as your office manager. Yes. Uh, how did that come about? Well, it was a horrible mistake. Is there anything else you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> you thought that having been married to a lawyer and being in the office with a husband, I'd have learned better, but I didn't. Well, but you two stayed married for many years. What? Twenty. Twenty years, yeah. I did eight, two, and twenty and did them consecutively. <laughs> Well, well, how did Pam decide to go to law school? Was she down in the I law office? I can't offices? imagine. I it, discouraged her every way I could. Why? You've got two it's lawyers. It's a hard way to make a living. It's hard to balance your time if you want to be a good mother. And I'm not whining. I know probably the same thing is true of men. We just don't think of it that way. Yeah. Uh, a male lawyer has to devote some time and plan how he's going to attend his children's functions and do things. I thought there were easier ways, but she married Phil Lawrence, and Phil Lawrence wanted to be a lawyer. So they went to law school together. Right. And that didn't turn out so well either. <laughs> she didn't learn a thing from her mother. <laughs> well, she did one. She's a real good lawyer. Did you have time for for, uh, I've got a note here that says, you know, you're, you said you, you adopted Charlie and adopted Ralph later. Were those children of, of natural children of Ralph's? My last two are Ralph Patey's children. Okay. I have, first three, we'll say, are from Mickey Cash. The last two, uh, Ralph's. I did not have children with Jack. He had his children. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like his and mine. <laughs> he had his, I had mine. <laughs> and the last two are Ralph's. So In between have... playing bridge, we did find time to do other things. So you got five children, three of whom were naturally born to you and two were adopted. No. I'm, well, I'm confusing lost then. you. Yes. Because I never really think of Charlie as adopted. Right. Charlie was adopted with Mickey. See, I didn't get pregnant for six years after I had, seven years after I had Pam. Yeah. And I thought I couldn't have children, so I adopted Charles. But I found out after I adopted Charles that the reason I didn't get pregnant was not my fault. It was Mickey's running around. So it's that Mickey, not you. Thank so, you. Make that clear. 
<laughs> yeah, when you start paying home, I got pregnant with Kim Ellen. So there's 13 months difference between those. Then when I married Ralph, I wanted more children because by that time Jack had taken his children and I felt very bereft. If you go from having five to three, it's a big hole in your life. Mm -hmm. So I had Ralph and Gay who then filled in and made my back to five. Sound like I'm filling full house. Hey, I'm supposed to have five, not three. I don't mean to get personal, and if you don't want to discuss this, don't. I don't, don't care. You don't, don't but, but you told us earlier, as you were growing up, your parents didn't want you dating Gentiles, and so you'd sneak out for late dates with, with, with the Gentiles, but yet you wound up marrying two Gentiles, and I suspect your parents were still alive. How did they, how did they react to that? Well, first of all, you've got to understand that things had changed considerably in the Jewish community. They began to realize that if they continued to exclude people who married Gentiles, they were going to fast deplete the Jewish community that mm -hmm. they better start welcoming. But <clears throat> my mother was very ill when I married Jack Hurst. She had cancer and she was afraid that she, well, she was going to die very shortly. And for me to be single with three children was a terrible thing in her opinion. It would be better that I even marry a Gentile than be a single mother. So she could accept that and then she did die when I married Ralph. She was not living. Okay. Of course my father was but see he didn't have the same feelings. Yeah. Let's go back to the law of practice. Um, your practice through the years has evolved from being pretty much a collection lawyer into being a general practitioner with an emphasis, and correct me if I'm wrong, in domestic cases and in tort liability cases from a plaintiff's point of view. How did that evolution come about? Was that on purpose or was this something that just happened? Well, part of it, as I told you, I never really wanted to just do collections. I didn't want to just go to sessions court. I wanted to be a real lawyer. I wanted to try jury cases. I'm like every other ham, you know, I want, I want to be in there. And the tort law was just gradually people would come to me and they bring me their little automobile cases. And then some of the lawyers, uh, Harry Burke was very good about sending me cases that he didn't want to handle. They weren't big enough for him. I was glad to get anything, so I was delighted. I'd ask for juries in cases that probably other lawyers would have tried without juries just so I could get experience. <clears throat> and I found that I liked it. Mm -hmm. I didn't get million dollar verdicts, but I, I did all right and gradually built a reputation for it. Now the family law practice was different. That was because the time evolved. People didn't get divorces when I started practicing law. It just didn't. Mm -hmm. When I divorced Mickey, that was a terrible thing in the community to get a divorce. Not just the Jewish community, the whole, the whole community. And gradually as that part of the law unfortunately has developed into quite a thing, I was already established as a lawyer, as a good family lawyer. I'm going to call it family lawyer because a lot of getting divorces isn't how bright you are or how anything except that you have an empathy for the fact that this is a traumatic experience for a family. And I call myself a good family lawyer, divorce lawyer, whatever you want to call it, because I'm always careful to remember these people have to go out and live together. It's not like a personal injury case where we can go in there and you battle with anything you got. And when you leave the courtroom, you're probably never going to see that person again. But in a family case, I'm going to have a perpetual relationship if there are children, probably, mm -hmm. with them for years till those children grow up. They are going to have to deal with each other. And you really try to see if they don't go out of there wanting to kill each other. Because if you do, those children are going to suffer. Are there any... any divorces or custody cases that particularly stand out in your mind as, as stressful for you that you've Fair. tried? Any that you, I mean, without naming names, but any special ones you can remember? Oh, there's so many. There are any of them that actually end up in front of the judges. 
and litigated with each party telling the other how bad they are and what sins they have committed. Mm. You know, anybody that's lived with anybody, you can think of a lot of things they do. And if you build it up and you put it out there in a courtroom, there's nothing worse than a bare fanny in a courtroom, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> You've seen some and I've seen some. You've seen them when they hide video cameras and before that still cameras and bring the pictures in of having caught their spouse with somebody else. And it is, it would be funny if it wasn't so serious and if it wasn't, didn't make such a bad impression on the whole, whole proceeding. You know, when you first began practicing law, and when I began, there really wasn't any alternative dispute resolution. It was just you tried the case or you somehow settled it between the parties. Uh, today, in, in domestic cases particularly, there's a big emphasis on alternative dispute resolutions. What's your view of that? How does it work or how does it not work in your experience? Think about it. I'm going to take issue with you on something you just said. You said in our day there was no, <laughs> I'm being generous to myself and putting myself at your age level. You said there was no alternative dispute resolution. No there formal, was. no formal. But we did it. Don't yeah. you remember how lawyers used to talk to each other before the insurance industry started controlling litigation, when lawyers were still controlling it? We settled cases. Lawyers did. We sat down and we talked about it. If it's a personal injury case, we jockey over lunch about how much. I once settled a case for $650,000 at a lunch at the Walden Club. Jim Robinson said he'd never eat lunch with me again. <laughs> but we did things like that. I don't like alternative resolution in family law. I think that lawyers have lost the ability to sit down together and talk with our clients. We all used to sit down. The clients would sit down and we'd try to work it out. What difference does it make if there's some person sitting there supposedly uninterested, or that's not the right word. What's the word I want where they're not involved? Neutral. Neutral. Thank you, sir some neutral person is going to work it out. You know what happens. I don't know if you do or not because you haven't been involved in the process. What happens is that neutral person wants it to work out because that looks good on them. They worked one out. They settled it in mediation. They can get back and report that. So the strong one usually won't budge. So what that mediator does is pull the weak one over there mm -hmm. and they're giving in. That's where the lawyer used to come in and stop and say, wait a minute, you're not going to do that to my client. I'm here because they're weak. I'm going to protect them. I think that's where the fault is in mediation. Where the parties are willing to work it out, they don't need a mediator. When they're not willing to work it out, a mediator is not going to help. Now, I'm going to surprise you where I have thinks it does help. I think in personal injury law, it has been a big help. I think a lot of cases have been settled in mediation that probably would never have set without going to court. They never settled, period. They'd been litigated had it not been for mediation. Sometimes it's hard for a plaintiff's lawyer to say to a client, your case really isn't worth as much as you think it is. Mm -hmm. I remember it well. Okay. You're, you know, you're in the position of negating your old client's injury, and that's not a good position where a mediator can say, hey, I don't think a jury's going to pay much attention to your complaints of pain and suffering. I think that's where it's helped. You know, so many lawyers shy away from, as you call it, family law or domestic law or divorce law, and you seem to like it. Why is that? Like what? Domestic law, family law. Why do I like it? Yes, when so many lawyers don't like it. Uh, why do I like it? I'm thinking whether I like it. I guess I do. Uh, you get closer to people, number one. And if I'm able to settle one, I feel good about it. If they're still friends, I feel really good mm -hmm. about it. And then a lot of times, if I think my client's been abused, 
and I feel like I've taken, and I hate to use this expression because it's not true. I was going to say a woman who's still prepared to face life on her own. And I've made her self-sufficient either by getting her enough assets or convincing her, hey, you're good, you'll make it. Sometimes just an emotional thing of reassuring them, you have ability, you just haven't used it yet, used it to make money. But sometimes it's the men who are so scared. Do you all think you're so brave? Sometimes the thought that they're going to be out there having to get back in the nightclub scene or uh, fend for themselves, they're going to have to cook and clean and do all the things, it terrifies them. It's not the bunny with the men usually. It's just the idea of having to do those things again. I remember, and I shouldn't tell you this, but I, since, I, since we're on a roll now, I will. But back when I practiced law, and from time to time I had divorce cases more often than I wanted, and I would have these clients come in and they'd say, my husband has hired Sonny Patey, or my wife has hired Sonny Patey. And the next question was, can you go up against her? Are you good enough to take her on? You've heard that a lot through the years, haven't you? Oh, I've had them tell me, my husband says if I fire you, he'll give me anything you want. <laughs> I want. <laughs> <laughs> I had one call me the other day and said she was firing me, and I said, okay, you have that right. And next thing I didn't hear from any lawyers, so I called her up and said, nobody's contacted me. Who are you going to hire? She said, oh, well, my husband told me if I just fired you, he and I could work it out. And I said, honey, don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you the words that I actually said to her, but you're fixing to have it put to you, honey. <laughs> little plain of vernacular than that. Okay. We've been going about an hour, and we're going to take a break in just a minute. But let me ask you one other question. Uh, just list for us some of the more colorful lawyers that you've practiced law with through the years. Oh, that's pretty easy. Fielding actually comes to mind immediately. Maurice Weaver, uh, who was a much better lawyer than his reputation ever, ever showed. Paul Campbell. And Fielding's we daddy was a good lawyer. When we come back from the break, I'm going to ask you some things about why you think they were colorful. So be thinking about that during our little break. Well, let's not blame before we do that. If I didn't mention Harry Burke, we need to put him in there right fast. Okay. <laughs> let's take our break now. Okay. <laughs> Before our break, you had said that there were certain lawyers you remembered as being colorful and you made sure we didn't forget Harry Burke, and you mentioned Fielding Atchley, and you mentioned Maurice Weaver. Uh, tell us a little about each of those three that, that made you think of them immediately. That... All right. I, I'm surprised I didn't start off with Harry Burke. Harry was always the epitome to me of a good lawyer, and I never knew why. He was a little, short, overweight Jewish man who always talked, seemed to have a little accent. You never could quite place it, but it was pretty it was obvious that it was a Jewish accent. And he always did well, and he got good verdicts, best in Hamilton County at the time. <clears throat> and I once asked Judge Cooper, who was Bob Cooper, was then circuit judge, who's since retired Supreme Court judge. And I said, tell me something, because I was just starting out and I really couldn't understand how this man could do this, get these big verdicts. I said, what is it that Harry Burke does that brings him these big verdicts? He's not <laughs> much to look at. And he doesn't overpower you with dramatics. What's his appeal? He said, Harry Burke tries every case as if he is preparing his appeal. And the juries understand that. Just like he makes the Court of Appeals judge understand his position, he makes the juries understand it. And after I listened to Harry, I understood that that's what he was doing. He was just efficiently covering, every efficiently, <laughs> my plate's getting in the way. 
efficiently covering every single point that might give the jury some problems. Well, in that regard, I've, I had Harry appear before me a lot when I was a trial judge, and what stood out in my mind, aside from all that you've mentioned, is he always made the case simple. Yes. No matter how complex the issue was, he had an ability to keep it simple so that the average juror could understand the heart of it, and he never wandered from his theme. I may uh, never try another case in your court, but I cannot resist saying this. Tell it. You really don't understand. When I said he was trying it as if he were trying it for an appeal, yeah. we have to keep it very simple for the appellate court. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you're right. You're right. All right. What about Maurice Weaver? What was there colorful and special about him? Oh, Maurice did a lot of criminal defense work, but he also could do great work. I remember what appealed to me about Mar Maurice so much was that he once won an accident, a bus company case, where his client got hit, pardon me, his client hit the back of the bus, and Maurice recovered for his client, and I couldn't believe he did that. You know, his client did the hitting. How could he possibly win? But Maurice was that kind. Now, he was flamboyant. He was dramatic. You know, the same reason I mentioned Steve Stone. Steve was a dramatic lawyer, yeah. very nice looking. Field, I don't think I did mention Steve. Fielding Ashley, John Barrymore, oh, he could get you. I'll never forget trying a case against Fielding. We'd just gotten women on the juries, and I was so proud of them. And by the way, they turned to be so hard on women. <laughs> they made my life miserable until I learned how to handle it. Women were jealous of women in business. They didn't want to be on the jury. They wanted to be home. And they didn't like the fact that women were working. So you're saying that the women jurors were tougher <laughs> on you than the male jurors? Yes. I had a field day in front of the men. You know, I was fairly attractive, and I was young, and I played sex to the hilt, and I was having a great time. And then they put women up there. And they didn't like seeing a young woman practice law. They felt like I should be home. So Fielding would play this. Oh, he loved it with that handsome profile. So I started playing the equal game with the men. I'd wear sweater suits. And Fielding would be working the women with this beautiful profile, and I'd be working the men, taking off my cardigan, and on and off, on and off. And finally, about the first end of the second day, he said, listen, I'll quit playing games if you will. I said, you got a deal, Fielding. We'll just try a case from now on. Well, speaking of that, what, what is the proper attire for a woman to wear to court as a lawyer? Is there anything that you well, say is a special? Well, when I started, it made a lot of difference what we wore. And uh, I would not have worn a dress like this. Only suits, dark suits, suits that looked professional. When pantsuits first came out, I will never forget that because I went to speak to a women's group at the University of Tennessee of young women studying to be lawyers. And they wanted to know what I thought about wearing pantsuits to court. And I said, I don't know about pantsuits. I said, I'll tell you my theory about what you should wear to court. I wear whatever I think the judge would like. If he wants me to be naked, I'll be naked. You know, but I don't think he will. <laughs> So the next time I got to playing with that idea, and Judge Wilson was trying a case for me, and I went into the judge and said, Judge, I have a question to ask you. What would you think about my wearing a pantsuit to try a case in your court? And he said, you do what you think you need to do, or should do. Just the way he said it, I mm -hmm. knew. <laughs> he didn't really think very much of that idea, so I did not. <laughs> but years later, when pantsuits were pretty well accepted, I did wear one to Judge Kelly's court. Ralph Kelly was a bankruptcy judge. And he turned to me, and I knew he didn't like it. And I said, now, Judge, I didn't know I was coming to your court today. I would not have worn pantsuit. And it had a long jacket to it. I said, and if you prefer, I will take off the pants. And Ralph reared back as he could do, and he said, Never let it be said that I ask a woman to take her pants off, at least in court. 
<laughs> but that shows how much the, the judges paid attention to it. And I think the juries did also. Now, you know, I wear white in court, I wear whatever I please. And there's no difference in the results? I don't think there is. Well, have I you ever been the victim the of sexual harassment me. by uh, lawyers or judges? You ever been the victim of, of sexual harassment by lawyers or judges? Oh, I wouldn't call it that. You know, I've been kissed by a few judges. I thought it was nice. I didn't think it was sexual harassment. I still don't. I don't understand harassment. I never have. I don't handle those cases. Pam handles uh, those cases. I don't handle those cases. Well, you know, some people define sexual harassment as un, un, unwanted or unwelcome How attention. do you know until you try? <laughs> so you never felt that it was unwanted or unwelcome? <laughs> I guess some of the judges and lawyers could accuse me of sexual harassment. I go up and rub their necks and blow in their ear and do whatever else I think helps. Uh, <laughs> maybe it was unwanted. I don't know. <laughs> I always thought we were just friends having a good time. Now, I really don't. Uh, I suppose that if you make your job dependent on whether or not a favor, sexual favor is granted, or any favor is granted, or anything, I think getting treated ugly by your boss who thinks it's okay to yell at you in the morning is harassment. I think that's wrong. But just the fact that somebody touches you or says good morning to you, and or how did you have, did you have a nice night? You know, you could read that wrong. You could read anything you want to read something into. You know, you said earlier that you began your practice in 1947, uh -huh. and it's now 2002, so if my math is correct, that's 50 years. Yeah. How has the practice of law changed from 1947 to 2002? the lawyers, the law, the judges, how, how have things changed and has it overall been for the good or not for the good? First, let's talk about women lawyers if we can. <clears throat> I think it's a lot better for women lawyers. First of all, there are a lot more. There doesn't seem to be any restraint at all. A pregnant woman now is perfectly acceptable. When I was pregnant in law school, I wasn't permitted to participate in moot court because the professor didn't think it looked good. Uh, mm. When I scheduled to try cases in front of a jury when I was very visibly pregnant, the judges didn't think it looked good. The juries didn't mind, by the way. They were very kind. But I don't think now it even raises a ripple. But I think that's because of television. They've gotten accepted of all things pregnancy. It's just now acceptable for women to do what they want to do. We've also freed you men, by the way. Because of us, you can now be stewardesses on airplanes, or stewards, they call. You know, Flight attendants. <laughs> Flight attendants. <laughs> We've opened it both ways. I think that's true in the law. I sometimes get disappointed by the fact that it don't, don't seem it doesn't seem they've made much progress in anything. We're still talking about a lot of the same things we were talking about. Chattanooga Bar just spent hours talking about whether to adopt an ethical code. Why do we need an ethical code? We all know what we should or shouldn't do. It just seemed to me a waste of exercise of a bunch of people sitting around a table talking. I think your Supreme Court has done a great deal in Tennessee towards bringing us into the fold. But I question why it has taken so long for us to get comparative fault. Why should it have taken all this time for us to have free discovery? And by the way, I kind of like the old days when nobody told you anything. You just went in there and guessed about what your opponent was going to do. You like that? Trial by ambush? Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you want to try a medical malpractice that, under those rules today? Probably the defense wouldn't be able to line up 15 witnesses to come in and say that it was okay. Oh. That whatever the doctor did was okay, that it may, patient may have died, but they would have died anyway. That's another thing we didn't talk about. We talked about your early years as a collection uh, lawyer, and then you moved into the domestic field, and, and you've done a lot of medical malpractice or yes. medical negligence uh, cases. How many do you think you've tried to a jury? I can't. I can't tell you over the years how many. Enough that I was admitted to the American Board of Trial Advocacy, and I think you have to have 50 trials or some jury trials or something, whatever it is. Yeah. 
Oh, you've had way more than 50. <laughs> Probably. I, they made me send in a list, but I don't remember how many. You know, most of the trials, though, uh, automobile cases are, don't take a great deal of effort. You get in a habit. You know what you have to prove. You have to prove damages. Uh, you have to prove the negligence is usually not any problem. Cases like medical malpractice are different because you have that terrible medical malpractice law. And something ought to be done about that, but it won't be. <clears throat> but on those cases, you have to get an expert. Without an expert, you're nowhere. And that expert has to say, yes, it was negligence. You know what it is. It has to be negligent. It has to be what caused your client to die. Those things are just the way they are. They're tough, they're hard, and they're going to continue to be. And expensive. And expensive. Very. What would you change about the, as you call it, the terrible malpractice law? What would you like to see change? If you were a, a lawyer or a legislator or a judge and you could wave a wand, what would you change? Take out that law that says, uh, that part of the law that says that your expert must be from Tennessee or contiguous states. It's ridiculous. All the doctors in this state are insured by State Volunteer, which is a mutual company. They share in the success and failure of the company. So you expect them to testify against another doctor? No way. No. Contiguous state, what are you going to get, Georgia? Emory sends doctors. They go to the same seminar. They send business back and forth to Vanderbilt from Emory. You know, it's a, an unreasonable restriction. Medicine should be recognized as being practiced nationally. Doctors qualified in New York, he, should, he or she, watch that. You story. might be interested to know. He or she a should case. be qualified to testify in a malpractice case in Tennessee without being the social pressure. You cannot imagine the social pressure put on doctors. I had one case I remember against an anesthesiologist, and I won't name the hospital, local hospital. They did not have an anesthesiologist on staff. My client had a epidural and had a reaction. One woman in a hundred is going to have some reaction, but she had a severe reaction. Because of a mix-up, there was only one nurse on the whole delivery floor. She couldn't find a doctor, and she panicked. A certified nurse anesthetist was giving the anesthesia. They didn't have the correct medication on their tray to resuscitate or to stop the effect of the seizure. So here they are, dashing this woman through the halls, trying to get to a delivery room when they should have just delivered her wherever. <clears throat> They're worried about the baby. She ends up a vegetable, which, by the way, is 23 years later, she's still living. Mm. That's a heart-rendering case, only because it was so terrible in the neglect and the negligence of not having anybody on that floor, no one is a certified nurse, pardon me, no anesthesiologist, no anesthesiologist on staff. And the OB was around the corner having coffee. This woman basically was unattended. I got a doctor at Vanderbilt who testified, a very qualified doctor. He was almost hounded out of his own country club because he had given a deposition in this case. I did settle the case, but I don't know how long he could have withstood the type of pressure. He told me, don't ever ask me to testify in another case for you. By the way, Vanderbilt has since put out kind of an unwritten law that their doctors do not testify in medical malpractice cases. In your experience, have lawyers been as reluctant as doctors to testify against their own in well, legal malpractice know. cases? Are lawyers reluctant to testify in them? I've testified in a couple. I don't know if they are or not. Uh, for, for the defendant or, or for the plaintiff? I've testified for the client. Was that difficult to do? Did you feel that kind of pressure that, that you say the, the doctors sometimes feel? Yes, I think that's a fair statement. I think the lawyers don't like it. Uh, 
<laughs> I'm trying to, trying to be honest. Yeah, I think a lot of pressure is exerted. I think the judges don't like it. I've seen cases that, very frankly, I, I thought judges should report to the disciplinary council that things that they saw in their own court that they didn't. Yeah. And I think it's for the same reason. It's a uh, I don't like the word fraternity, but I don't know another word to use. By the way, I do resent being a fellow in the Tennessee Bar Foundation or a fellow in the Chattanooga Bar. What would you rather be titled? I don't know. I've thought about that. They've convinced me that it's kind of an asexual term, but it's kind of like guys, they tell me. But those things still have a connotation to me of, uh, of male. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think would be a good substitute in a... Well, I think flight attendant wouldn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but that's something that perhaps we ought to think about. <laughs> I don't know. I've thought about it, and I've just kind of accepted it. I guess the uh, when I went around, I was elected finally president of the bar, and I went around and asked people, the lawyers, I said, what bothered you more, the fact that I was a woman? or the fact that I was a Jew. And they said, oh, we never realized you were a woman. Well, that really did make me feel good, and I knew they were backhandedly paying me a compliment. <laughs> what has been the most stressful lawsuit you've ever been involved in? Does one stand up particularly? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, you're talking about from a personal danger yes. standpoint? Uh, I once sued the estate of Paul Gray. Hmm in a case in which there was a shootout that Paul Gray used to own a nightclub here. And there was a shootout between Mr. Gray and a man who had married his ex-wife. Involved over whether or not a child would go visit with his father, Mr. Gray, or whether he would stay at a birthday party that was being held by the ex-Mrs. Gray. And in the shooting that evolved, I represented Mrs. Gray, the ex-Mrs. Gray and her new husband. And I sued the estate for the damages that he had done. He very seriously injured him. Unfortunately, my client had also killed Mr. Gray in the process. But there was a lot of tension. And word was out that somebody was going to pay for this for having sued the Gray estate, and it was going to be me. And there were some people that had guns with them, and uh, of course the court officers took those away, but still there was a lot of feeling in the whole case that went on for about four days, and during all the intermission, people were walking around threatening me, making remarks as they went by me and went by my client court officers had to escort us to our car. That was a little stressful. Mm. Of course, there's also the one in the, but that was kind of a joke. I thought it was a joke. It turned out not to be. In divorce case where one of the defendants, the husband, kept following me around. Finally, I got tired of being followed around and I offered him a ride in my car. <laughs> and I said, look, you've been following me around now for a couple of weeks. It's really getting on my nerves. What is it you want? Just tell me. He said, sure. He said, I'll tell you. He said, I'm going to shoot either you or my wife, and I haven't decided which one. Well, he made the right decision. He chose her. He didn't kill her, but he did injure her. So yeah. She called me up, and in our crazy system, he was in her hospital room before I was. And I was just at the courthouse, and she was at the old Newell Hospital. And when I got to the room, he's sitting there. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I made Bob before I ever shot her. And, of course, that's the system. You can do that. And I said, you want to go on with this divorce? I'll have him put in jail right now for harassing you. She said, oh, no, I'm going to live with this man. I'm going to live with him, and he's going to pay me forever. And he did. <laughs> mm. That has to be the strangest story I've ever heard. Well, that's what family law is, by the way. Yeah. Have you ever had any cases that stick out in your mind that are just downright funny? They what? Just funny cases. Funny? Yeah. Not really. It may be funny to us. They're never funny to litigants. No. No. Have you ever fired a client? Oh, all the time. All the time. 
What's the what's the reason? I have normally? a rule about that. When you keep seeing a name come up for a call back and you really don't want to call it back, mm -hmm. time to get rid of the client. Of course, sometimes I have to get rid of them because they're harassing my employees. And when the employees start dreading hearing a name, that's time to ask somebody to get another lawyer. Yeah. Then you know me, I'm willful. If a client doesn't want to do what I think is right, I don't need them. And I just ask them to get somebody who's more sympathetic to their viewpoint than I am. I wish I'd been more disciplined along those lines. I had a lot that I didn't like. And couldn't get the nerve up to fire them. You never got to be practicing law at 75 to get a lot of choices. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like you have more choices now? Are, are people deferential to you now based on your age and experience? I think they are deferential. I think the judges, by the way, it's a pure pleasure to try cases in front of men, some of them who are young enough to be my children, and a lot of them almost young enough to be my grandchildren. They're very differential now, and I appreciate that. I appreciate the courtesy shown to me. And I will say this, everybody has been great about my deafness. Uh, great, <laughs> that's a funny word to use, but you know what I mean. It is a pain, it's a pain for me, it's a pain for the judges, I know that. I haven't noticed any problems you've had today during our little talk. Well, it's just you, you know, in this environment, you put me in the middle of a big courtroom and the acoustics are not always good. Even the jurors, you can tell jurors often can't hear. You've seen them, they lean up and they cup their ear. Yeah. Some of the courtrooms are miserable. And then some of our judges, bless his heart, how people see never change expression. Sometimes I engage what y'all are thinking by the looks on your face, but you try to gauge that poker face and you're just gone. <laughs> he never changes. Uh, but everybody's been courteous about that part of it and cooperative, and juries have seemed to understand. I always tell them, now you understand, I'm going to have to read off this CRT sometimes because I don't know what the witness is saying. And so I'm going to lose a little time, and I hope that you'll bear with me because there is a lag till it gets from the court porter's ears to her brain to her fingers to the cable up for me. And they've all been great. That's not been a problem. The only thing that's made me mad is I can't get the courtrooms properly mic'd so that jurors can hear what's going on. And I've had judges sit up there that I knew didn't know. Judge Walker, David Tom Walker, bless him, he talks so loud. And part of the reason he talks so loud was his hearing was getting bad and he couldn't hear himself. I'm about in that boat. <laughs> well, you've always talked loud. <laughs> Judge Joe Hunter was the same way, and I asked Joe Hunter a hundred times, get a hearing aid, Judge. He said, oh, just because you're deaf, you think everybody else is. <laughs> but that's been the exception. I can't let this interview go by without talking a little about Dudley's. Do you remember Dudley's? That what? Dudley's. My bar? Your bar. There you are. You don't talk about my second childhood. Well, we are going to get a successful lawyer, a successful <laughs> mother, a leader in the bar, a leader in the community, and you go out and open up a country western bar. Tell about that. Opened up two. <laughs> I just won. <laughs> that was my second childhood. I figured you ought to do something else. And I had a, my youngest son didn't seem to be motivated to do anything. And I had a boyfriend who was less motivated than my son. And I thought, well, I'll buy a bar and put both of them to work. <laughs> and it was wonderful. Good old country bar. People were down to earth. You talk about Lebanon and what do you think's going on over there? And they think you're talking about Lebanon, Tennessee. <laughs> and their greatest worry is whether or not they're going to be able to make their car payment come the weekend. And I never saw so many people drawing benefit checks. They're all drinking during the day, but they got a benefit check coming in. <laughs> it was a wonderful environment to see people happy, unstressed. I love to go down after a hard day and sit there and drink and dance and just had a great time. How many years did you run, run Dudley's? I had uh, that one for eight years, and I had Patey Place, a downtown bar, for two. 
Would you ever want to be back in the bar and restaurant business again? No. <laughs> <laughs> I got out of the bar business when I lost my liquor insurance. The industry decided that when they started suing bar owners for drunk driving, yeah. that it was too dangerous to have coverage. When it got too dangerous to have coverage, it got too dangerous for me to stay in it. Nineteen sixty six, I believe, you ran for as a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. I didn't do real well. Never run against a well, I'm not Black as interested Baptist in that as much in as I am about, about how, how, how your race for the Constitutional Convention landed you as a litigant in the U.S. Supreme Court. Tell, tell us how that came about. Okay. When I got into the race, uh, I didn't have any substantial opponent. And then the Reverend James McDaniel, is that his first name? Paul McDaniel. Paul McDaniel, yes decided he was going to get in. If I'd had any sense at all, I'd have gotten out of it, but I didn't have any sense. But it bothered me that we had a statute on the books that said that people who are preachers, ministers, rabbis, priests cannot serve in the legislature. And one of the requirements for running for the Constitutional Convention was that you had the same qualifications as someone who runs for the legislature. Reverend McDaniel beat me handily, to put it mildly. My workers were driving his voters to the polls. <laughs> it was that bad. <laughs> but anyway, I decided that we should either get rid of this statute and say it's unconstitutional or enforce it one way or the other. So I filed suit. The chancellor said that it was unconstitutional. Tennessee Supreme Court reversed the chancellor and said, <coughs> pardon me, chancellor said it was constitutional. Now I've got it reversed, unconstitutional. Supreme Court said that that statute could not, could be enforced and should be enforced and that Reverend McDaniel could not serve in the Constitutional Convention. The Reverend McDaniel took it one step further. He took it to the United States Supreme Court and they held properly that the statute was unconstitutional. Now, did you represent yourself, or did you Oh, I've got better sense than that. Only a fool would represent themselves. Who? Phil Lawrence represented me. Your son-in-law. <laughs> 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 now, let's talk a little about how, how the, the, the practice is here now with your, you've got in this office, you've got Charlie, your son, you've got Pam, your daughter, You've got Sherry, that's Charlie's wife, your daughter-in-law, and you've got Allison Eulen, your niece, practicing here right. with you. You've also got two grandsons who are lawyers, one in Chattanooga with his father's firm and one in New York. Right. So how do you get along with your partners? Wonderful. Almost never have a, a I can only remember one professional disagreement, and we've never had a personal disagreement. But that's very simple to account for because we have a, what I call a democratic dictatorship. We discuss everything, and then I make the decisions. And I've offered several times, you know, anytime you all get tired of this arrangement, I'll retire and you all can make the decisions. They have not yet taken me up on it. Anytime they do, I'm willing. I well, like practicing by myself, by the way. We're right back to that again. <laughs> so you don't have any plans to retire anytime soon? None whatsoever. When they move me out of here, if they ever take me up on that offer, I own this block and I'm going to take the office right down the street from them. You remember John Wrinkle, don't you? Sure. Uh, John practiced till he was about 100. Would you like to be another John Wrinkle someday? Uh, if I can be uh, as if I can have all of my faculties, as he did. John had selective hearing, too. He could hear what he wanted to and not hear what he didn't want to. <laughs> you may fall into that category. I've only been accused by that by husbands, never by anybody else. If you could start over again, would you do anything differently? No, not a bit. What's been not the most? Not one thing I honestly can say that I've told everybody. 
when I die, if there's a tear in this crowd, boy, y'all gonna make me mad. I want you to break out a bottle of shampoo, play when the saints come marching in and have a celebration because this woman has lived. I think that's a good spot to end on. Thanks a lot. It's been great. Really As always, I've enjoyed you. <clears throat>